He is known around the world as the Black Knight and is widely considered to be one of the greatest golfers of all time. He has not been baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but has spent time with President Gordon B. Hinckley and in 2021 played golf with Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf. He has also been spotted in Latter-day Saint sacrament meetings around the world. So what is the Black Knight's connection to the church? Well, you'll just have to listen to this episode to find out. Gary Player is one of only five golfers in history to win all four major golf championships in his career. He has won nine major championships as well as over 150 professional tournaments on six continents over seven decades. He was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame in 1974. Amanda Lee Player Hall has worked in the architecture field and as a freelance artist, but her passion lies in helping others. Amanda worked for several years with the Gary Player Foundation as an art director and for various other notable nonprofits. She is now leading the Gary and Vivian Player Foundation, honoring her parents' legacy to love and lift children in need and ensure that they have a better life. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am so honored to have Amanda Lee Player Hall and her father, golf legend Gary Player, on All In today. Thank you both so much for being with me. Oh, thanks so pleasure. much for having us. Absolute that, pleasure. Morgan. Well, this is so exciting. And I think I I have just been so excited because I was talking to somebody at work and I said, they said, do you have any exciting episodes coming up? And I was like, well, do you know who Gary Player is? And the lady looked at me like I was absolutely insane and was like, the golf player? (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, yes, the golfer. <laughs> anyway, so we are going to surprise some people, I think, today with this episode. You are both originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. What would you say are the biggest cultural differences between the United States and South Africa for those of us that have never experienced uh, that part of the world? Well, first of all, there's absolute very poor knowledge about South Africa and America I'll just tell you something golf-wise. We've won 23 major championships, the big, big tournaments of the world, uh, more than any country in the world other than the United States of America. So that doesn't happen unless you've really got a very highly educated, sophisticated society. South Africa is probably the greatest piece of real estate on the planet today. They have the best beaches, white beaches with beautiful restaurants on them, trails into the mountains with bicycles, uh, game reserves with all the animals in monkey parks. They've got uh, trails where you can do bicycles, as I said, without being repetitive or walking or horseback. They've got magnificent restaurants, the best climate in the planet. That's where I live in a particular place. But unfortunately, our government is not doing as well as we'd like to see them doing. We're struggling. There's not the unity that there should be. There's not the faith that there should be. But we were blessed to have a man like Nelson Mandela, who I spent three years with. We raised 20 million plus minus for young black children. He was a great son of God. Here's a man. He didn't come out with the kind of uh, religion talk or religious talk that Martin Luther King did. I always love the way, you know, people call him Dr. Martin Luther King. I call him Reverend Martha Luther King because he was a man that spoke about Jesus and the Lord, which we were so proud of, even of the adversity that he lived in. But Mandela was an incredible, and I, every time I was with him, which was a lot of time in my life, I cried. I could not hold my tears back because a man that could have that kind of adversity, which we all have to have in our life some way or another, we cannot escape adversity. But being with this man who had extreme adversity, I couldn't stop crying. And I thought of the greatest word that exists in any dictionary, in the book of Quran, in the book of the Bible, whatever, the book of Judaism, whatever it may be, the word love is still the appropriate, strongest word of everything that exists, because love is God. So our similarities in our country, a very religious country, but unfortunately, unfortunately, religion and freedom is dying 
in the entire world today. Even in the greatest country that God ever provided, the United States of America, freedom is on the wane and, it, and religion is on the wane, which is very, very sad for me. But we have the army of God behind us and nobody can beat God's army. Doesn't matter what cannons and uh, guns you bring along. In the end, we will prevail. And we've got to get the young people because the youth of a nation or the trustees of posterity. These are the people we've got to try and get them to understand the importance of Jesus in your life. How anybody survives without Jesus in their lives, I don't know. I would just add to that, you know, there's 11 official languages in South Africa, but the African people are one of the most special and unique people on this planet, just so full of love and so embracing. And so it's wonderful to see the gospel just flooding Africa. And it's just, it's a, it was a wonderful place growing up and it's a wonderful place to visit and to, to go and see. So I encourage you to go, Morgan. Well, I'm, I'm learning all the reasons I feel like I should go. So this is great. And also, I have to say, I think this is the first time we've ever had anyone on this show that knows Nelson Mandela. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Gary, your mother, if it's okay with you, I'd like to kind of go back in time a little bit. Your mm -hmm. mother passed away when you were eight years old. Um, I wondered, I watched an interview where you talked about how your mother never saw you hit a golf ball, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty crazy to think about for somebody that <clears throat> has captivated people all over the world with your, with your ability to play that game. So how did losing your mom at such a young age strengthen your faith in Christ and what kind of impact did that have on your life? Um, one of the great sayings or the commandments about honor your mother and your father is so true. And if you think of how many children today, a high percentage that don't honor their mother and their fathers, it's a lot higher than we think. It's quite shocking when you think about it. But I adored my mother, and actually she died when I was nine. And my brother went to war that, uh, when I was uh, a young boy and he was 17. My father worked in a gold mine 8,000 feet underground for 30 years going down into that hellhole for a hundred pounds a month to educate his children and get put food on the table. So the school I went to taught me about dress code, talk about, taught us how to pray in school. We still have prayer in those schools, which is so good. And that's for me so sad that they took it out of American schools. It doesn't mean to say you've got to have a Christian faith. You can be a Muslim, you can be a Jew, you can be anything, but just say a prayer of some kind that suits everybody. Because I don't know how you survive without the love of the Lord, whether you're a Muslim, whatever you might be. So our schools still have that address code, as I say. And so it was very difficult for me because I'd come home from school, which was an hour and a half, and I'd get to a dark house, nobody there at nine. I had to cook my own food, make my own bed, et cetera, et cetera. Wake up in the morning at 5.30 to go to school, and I lay in bed. I can vividly remember every night of my life crying, wishing I was dead. That was the greatest gift ever bestowed upon me. You see, what is taken away is given in another way. And so there I was feeling sorry for myself, which unfortunately is a trait of the human being. They don't want to have adversity. They feel sorry for themselves. And you've got to realize, as we said in the beginning of the show, everybody has their chance to have adversity, and that's how you handle it. And how better can you handle it than to have the Almighty on your side and to give you strength to accept it. So well said. How would you say that growing up without a mother affected your appreciation for your wife and the way that she raised your children? That's a wonderful question. And, you know, up until the age of 32, I can remember waking up crying at night, longing for my mother because I absolutely adored my mother. And uh, to have her taken away was a very, very difficult thing in my life. As I said, she never saw me become a world champion. But we know that she saw it from above. We know that. And so we've got to be comforted by that. But there's so many questions, you know, today people say, well, they ask so many questions, which is good. But we're not supposed to be uh, exposed to the answer. We don't have to know everything, and we don't know everything, and that, I think, is the great secret, to seek and ye shall find. The trouble is everybody wants instant answers today. Young people get married today, 10 years, 
is almost a record now. They're not prepared to battle it out. We and my wife, or my wife and I were together for 72 years. I met her when I was 14 and she was 13. And what a, what a gift it was bestowed upon me and how we battled it out and worked things out together. So, you know, what has taken away your mother, your dear, dear mother, and then to find a woman at the age of 14 and to build this great strength and love together and have six wonderful children, 22 grandchildren, two great grandchildren. You see what he takes away? He gives back tenfold if you seek him in your life. I love that. Well, I feel like there may be people listening that are like, okay, why, how did you get Gary player on this podcast? And I think that we probably need to establish that Amanda, you are a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you were dating a member of the church in high school. That's how you initially came in contact with the church from what I understand. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, your boyfriend invited you to a church meeting. From there, you wanted to know more. What do you think it was that obviously your dad has incredible faith in the Lord? What do you think it was that drew you to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? That's an excellent question. You know, I think growing up, I, I was privileged and had the opportunity to be exposed to so many different faiths and cultures and religions. And was appreciative of those. And obviously, we grew up in a home with tremendous faith. I had the opportunity to go to a Catholic uh, primary school or elementary school. I remember just, you know, we went to Mass every week. And I was always so impressed with the devotion of the nuns. And I loved them. And they taught me. And I remember probably, I was probably 9 or 10. And I remember going to one of them and saying, I think I want to become Catholic or a nun. And, you know, in their wisdom, looking back, they, they were just so sweet. And they were like, you know what, Amanda, I think you need to just keep searching and, and be patient and the Lord will guide you. And I was so grateful for that, for that wisdom, because it definitely did put me on a path of searching. And as a teenager, I was, I did look at many different churches and went through confirmation classes. And then when I met Michael, um, I went to church with him for the first time and it was a fast and testimony meeting. I think their family was just cringing, but again, I was so impressed or so touched by, um, the sincere expressions of faith. And I was really impressed with people's personal connection to the savior and to their devotion to their faith. And so I think that was where it really, really impacted me and gave me the desire to learn more. And you were initially hesitant to even tell your parents that you were learning more about the church. Is that right? Uh, well, yes. I mean, I think they knew I was dating Michael and, um, the next time I was home from college after, you know, going to church for the first time, you know, they, their family invited me to go to their home for lunch. And the missionaries just happened to be there, which, you know, looking back now, it wasn't a coincidence. But, you know, as I started talking to the missionaries, they invited me to learn more or to take the discussions, what we called them back then. I'll never forget, you know, that, that first discussion, I was sitting there with the missionaries and um, they held up the flip chart. You know, we used to have flip charts back then. And uh, they shared their experience of of Joseph Smith, the young boy, you know, kneeling in a grove and um, the experience that he had. And I, the only thing I can explain to you is that I was just overcome with this incredible feeling of warmth. And, you know, even to this day, I, I have to acknowledge that that was a heavenly experience. And I've never been able to deny that experience ever. You know, I continued the discussions and I learned about baptism being the next step. So I think my parents were aware that I was, in, you know, studying, but they didn't have any idea that I was wanted to be baptized. And of course, you know, I'd heard all these nightmare stories of people being disowned by their families. And, you know, I just said, I adored my parents and my family. And so the idea of, of them disowning me because of that decision was just, terrifying to me. And so I held back telling them, I remember a kid telling my mom and dad, I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. <laughs> I don't know if they remember this, but I built it up and I'm sure they were thinking she's going to drop out of college. <laughs> she's, you know, whatever. I don't know what they thought, but by the time I finally told them, I'm like, I want to get baptized. They were like, I think they were so relieved. They were, they were just thrilled. <laughs> so that's really the way that you should handle this. You set expectations very low. And then... Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's interesting because 
you know, the Mormon church, maybe because of the enemies of the church, and there are a lot of enemies in the world today, you know, the rumors that were spread. And I thought, gee, uh, you know, as my daughter, I know you call it the Church of Jesus Christ or the Latter-day Saints now, but those days they call it the Mormon Church. And there were the terrible rumors that you're allowed to have five wives, et cetera, et cetera, and you don't believe in Jesus Christ. This rumor was spread around. And I know when I went to listen to President Hinckley, who I had the honor of meeting on two occasions with Vivian I, what the most wonderful man you could ever wish to meet, Mr. Ugdorf, he was just, I played golf with him not so long ago. Wonderful people. And we knew so little about the church. And now, having been educated with my my wife, my daughter, my grandchildren, and quite a lot of uh, people in your church and our family, these young boys that you have, or young men that give up two years of their life, I've always thought that one year was sufficient, but two years of your life, they come back, they've had an education, it's like an army training, which young people in America today really need because they've got a sense of entitlement and they're not entitled to anything. But they come back like Luke, he speaks Spanish fluently, Amanda speaking to ladies in our house today that are Spanish, speaking fluently. So your church has produced such the most wonderful young men that are humble, well-mannered, dress properly, shave every day, look, uh, uh, not that I criticize somebody that doesn't, but these are young men representing a church and there's a time to go your way or another way. But whilst you're a member of the church, you've got to behave like the church requires you. And it's a great discipline and they turn out to be wonderful people. If I was a young man today in my teens, I wouldn't think, Anything else about being a member of your church, that would be my prime choice because I can travel anywhere in the world and get off a plane and I can pick them out in the airport. They stand out. They stand out. And this great country, that's exceptional if you can stand out because this is a very competitive country. I'm a bit old to change now. I'm 86. I don't want to go do all that studying. I've had enough of that now. You know, I want to just for the last few years, I don't even know when my alarm clock's going to go off. We're not giving up, Morgan. We're not giving up. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not too late. Um, let me ask you this, Gary. You mentioned that your wife also joined the church. Was it any different when it was your wife versus when it was your daughter learning about the church and wanting to, to join the church? No, because you've got to be open-minded. We are lucky that we live in countries. If you live in China... And a lot of other countries around the world, you cannot go joining churches and have the choice of religion and have the freedom of speech. So I want my family to choose whoever they want to. I would obviously love them to have Christ in their lives. But if they choose to become a, a Muslim or whatever, they, or become a, to Magi, become Jewish or whatever it might be, that's their choice. We have freedom. Freedom is such a great word that, that my brother went to war to fight for, and all the young, wonderful men fought for freedom. If you go along and you look at Normandy, for example, it's a, we should have it, that picture of Normandy should be shown in every school. You don't get freedom through negotiations. You get freedom through fighting, unfortunately. And so what people have gone through for us, and so Winston Churchill and Roosevelt, who won the war for us, you know, th- these are things we got to be very, very thankful for, that we have the freedom, and I want my family to choose whatever they want to be. I don't want them to have to choose what I want them to be, and that's uh, uh, very essential in families, and people must accept things. They mustn't be reluctant to change. Well, I think that's, I think that's so wonderful. My grandmother was a convert to the church, and I didn't know until just a few years ago that I guess her parents were super disappointed when she joined the church and she was the only child in her family. And so she adored her parents. And I think that that was just excruciating to feel like she had disappointed them. And so I think that that's huge. And I appreciate your example of that. Amanda, you served a full-time Spanish speaking mission in New Jersey. You hadn't been a member of the church super long when you decided to serve. Talk to me a little bit about that and what your parents reaction to your desire to serve a mission was like? Yeah, after I graduated from my undergraduate degree in architecture in South Africa, I went and I worked in California for a year and was there that I lived alone and um, I really had studied and I just, you know, I knew that I wanted to, if I could just change one person's life, like mine had been changed 
to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ that nothing I could do would, you know, would be worth, everything would be worth it to be able to do that. And so I, I put my papers in and my, I think my dad was extremely, extremely supportive of that, except I think he was petrified I was going to go some crazy place that wasn't going to be safe. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he was thrilled when I received my call to serve in um, the New Jersey Morristown mission. I actually was called, received my call as an English speaking missionary. And I, it was kind of crazy because before I got my call, I was living in California and I'd had this really just, you know, I, I was down in San Diego and I, I was, mariachi bands were there and I had this overwhelming feeling that I had this connection to this culture. And so I really thought I was going to get, uh, you know, go to Spain or somewhere like that. And so when I got my call to New Jersey, I was surprised. One, I couldn't even find it on the Atlas, you know, getting my call in South Africa. But when I, I went into the MTC and again, all, a lot of my district were going to Spanish speaking countries. And I remember telling my branch president, you know, telling him, I, I was a pretty new member and I said, I've had these feelings and I just can't get them away that I feel like I should be speaking Spanish. And he kind of rebuked me and said, you know, you don't question the line of authority. And, and so I felt, of course, I was just mortified. I just never wanted to upset anyone. And anyway, I arrived in New Jersey in my first interview with my mission president, who was just an amazing man and actually loved my dad. He said, Sister Player, your call has been you changed to be a Spanish speaking missionary. And uh, I just remember this overwhelming experience that the Lord knew me and that He knew that He was preparing me. And so I actually learned Spanish in the field, and it was just an amazing experience. We're sitting here in my son in law's office, and we're looking out on a forest, a, a very thick, enormous forest. And you know, people often say to me, How? How can I believe in the Lord? I can't see him. And the first thing I say, well, can you see the wind? But you can feel it. And if you search, you will feel the Lord. And you look at these trees, and all winter you'd swear they were dead. And now they're all the leaves that are coming out and the flowers are there. Isn't it a miracle? We are faced with miracles. You know, having traveled more miles than anybody that ever lived, when I first started, we traveled on airplanes with no jets, no earphones, no beds, Traveling from South Africa to here, uh, 40 hours, stopping four times in some very strange places, and pe- the children sleeping on the floor. And so, you know, it's, it's just been such a wonderful experience to see how time has changed and how we've evolved with all the technology. But as long as we can accept the technology and not get away from the crux of the matter, which the heart of the matter is you've got to have faith. Because that's an old true saying that faith can move mountains. And I, it's tough for a lot of people who say, well, I can't see it. I can't feel it. Well, with my wife having passed away after 72 years, I today am sleeping in the same bed we slept in. I put my hand across there. I don't feel anything physically, but I do know that she is responding to me and knows that I'm talking to her. Gary, I loved what you said about your wife and you mentioned, you know, I think a a feeling that a lot of people experience in grief. My grandfather passed away about a year and a half ago and it's been so interesting to watch my grandma since he passed and she she and I were on the phone one day and and she said, you know, I I don't know what happens after we die. But I sure hope that all of this is true. <laughs> and I said, I think that it is. Um, but I think that that it becomes something that is very real. You know, we need to know it more than ever when somebody that we love has passed away. Amanda, your parents were married for how many years? We were together for 72 and married for 65. Okay. Um, Tell us a little bit, Amanda, from your perspective about both your father and your mother and their marriage and what made them so special as parents and as spouses to one another. I think of Nephi when he said, I was born of godly parents. And um, I certainly was. And the commandment to honor and love your parents has not been a hard one for me. They're just remarkable individuals that love the Lord. Um, loved each other and just have an unbelievable abundance of love for other people. I think for me that what's really impacted me is their great humility, that they've never really been affected by wealth or fame. Watching my dad, I mean, you know, he taught us by example, by the way he's lived. And I've seen him, how he talks to the man on the street or cleaning the street and how he talks to the president of the United States. And 
it's exactly the same way and the same respect and kindness. So I think they were remarkable. My mom, she was a remarkable individual and she, she was definitely the anchor of our family. She knew how to fill the voids in all of our lives. And we miss her terribly. I think as parents, they, you know, they had, they were apart for so many, so much of their life and their marriage. And so they, even as equals, they had definitely had very different roles and they sacrificed greatly for each other. Looking back, actually a friend had mentioned something to me and it really impacted me that, you know, they weren't perfect. They forgave each other quickly. But what impacted me was, um, was how they, they treated each other. And every time they, they greeted each other or said goodbye, it was always very affectionately and with a kiss. And you know, that's, a, that's a good lesson for me, and especially for you, Morgan, as a, a new, new married couple. But it was always tender. And they were the yin and the yang to each other. My mom had a little bit of a serious side, and my dad has this amazing sense of humor. So he always made her laugh. And that was wonderful to see. But I'd, I'd say just, obviously, my dad shared with you that theirs was the greatest love story that I've ever heard, heard about. And they just their deep love for each other is an inspiration for me. You talk about a miracle. I was living in a very poor suburb because we were very poor, as I mentioned. <laughs> there was a wall between our neighbor and ourselves, and I put a rock there because I was not tall enough to look over the wall. But I was exercising, in which I've always been a great fiend of exercise. And so my brother was standing on the rock. He says, you've got to come and look at this little chick that's come to visit our neighbors next door. So I went there and I saw her. And I said, good morning. She said, good morning. I said, what's your name? She said, Vivian. I said, oh, that's nice. So I said, do you play golf? She says, I knew she did because the lady told me her father was a golf professional. So I said, do you play golf? She says, yes. She said, would you like to play with us next Saturday? I said, I'd love to come and play because my dad played. I said, I'll see you next Saturday. I got off the wall. Now, this didn't take two minutes. I said to my brother, you see that girl, Christopher? I'm going to marry her. He said, what are you talking about? You've seen her for two seconds. And then I went to hospital to have a cartilage out. In those days, they did a big cut in your leg, not osteoscopic like now. And I was in hospital, and she came out of school at the age of 13. With her sixth sense, she bought a ticket on a tram into town, walked across town, got on a bus, came out to a, a town called, suburb called Park Town, walked a mile down the road to come and see me in hospital. And I thought, I'm seeing things. This little 13 year old come all this way. She was there for an hour, and I plucked up the courage to ask if I could have a kiss goodbye which thank goodness she agreed on. And I saw her walking away in the distance. I said, now I'm definitely marrying this chick. There's no question about it. And what a choice I made. That's an amazing story. That's so good. So you have recently renamed your foundation. Um, It's now the Gary and Vivian Player Foundation. It's a foundation that seeks to help children living in poverty. Gary, I read something that you said where you said Vivian was always passionate about the plight of children throughout the world and in her own quiet way was devoted to lifting, loving, and supporting children who were in need. If you both could talk to me because you both work heavily with this, talk to me about what your foundation is seeking to do and how you feel it honors Vivian? Well, first of all, this foundation that we formed here now is for America. You see, America is always helping everybody instead of helping themselves a little bit more, I feel. So this is strictly for America in gratitude for what they've done for me and my family. And also, my wife and I both adore children. Through golf, through this wonderful game of golf, I've changed tens of millions of lives in China, in Africa, built hospitals, churches, schools, and in Britain, uh, homes for the, uh, the homeless and lying in the streets of London. So golf has been this great instrument to help me change the lives of so many people. And I'm so grateful for what golf did. And when we had our farm in South Africa, which was one of the most beautiful ranches you ever saw in your life, We had 63 employees, so there were a lot of children, at least 100, at least. And we built a church on the farm. And every Sunday we had church, and this was right out, lived out in the sticks. But she'd always stay afterwards and entertain these children and spend time with them. And she just loved children. And now Amanda 
having taken me to the school here in Philadelphia and to see these children and to know that we can now help change their lives. What a gift from the Lord to be in a position to do this. I mean, it's just such a great gift that's been bestowed upon me. Yeah, the foundation is really a wonderful opportunity to honor my mother and to lift children out of poverty here in this country. My mom, you know, she spent a large amount of time on the sidelines of golf courses watching my dad, and she was very happy not to be in the spotlight, but she was never on the sidelines of the most important things in life, and that was helping people. And like my dad said, been, she loved to teach uh, children how to sing, I'm a child of God. She always wanted to be a nursery school teacher, in fact. And so she couldn't bear the idea of any child suffering or being harmed. And uh, in fact, when I was State Relief Society president, now I was always involved in different activities. And so she was always the first one to be sending money or buying coats. or. And so I think she was most upset to hear about the statistics of one in six children living in poverty in the United States. And I think one of the biggest things that upset her was 30% of all homeless people, especially here in this country, are children. And so she went, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to care for her the last 18 months of her life. And she really kept telling me the desires of her heart to really try and make a difference in those children's lives. And so, you know, using golf as a wonderful platform to raise funds and to support organizations that are doing impactful work with lifting children out of poverty. So the foundation is really focused on three main areas to do that, which is education, health and housing. So right now we're supporting two main um, organizations that are really doing impactful work. But we also have a grant. We'd we'd like to, we're looking for additional organizations that need additional help, that are doing important work but might need a hand up or extra financial support. So on our website, there is a link to people who are needing grants. And we'd like to really encourage people to to apply so that we can can help them. If possible. If possible, yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Gary, when your wife passed away, you wrote this. Vivian taught me the value of love, faith, and trust. She taught our children those same values, and they were blessed to have a mother who lived those values every single day. I wondered, especially, I think one thing that I have found really intriguing about the idea of having both of you on this show is I don't think we've ever had an episode with somebody that was not a member and somebody that was a member from the same family. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that, that some people struggle to navigate. So I wondered how did this example of faith that Vivian exuded and, and taught your kids, how did this play out in your everyday life and what did it look like in practice in your home? Well, first of all, my mother and my father, mainly my mother was a great believer and had strong faith. And the schools I went to in South Africa were all full of faith. So I came along after being married as a person that had faith. I didn't have to become a member of your church or to have a wife that made me believe stronger. But I tell you what, I never said so many prayers in my life. She wanted to pray three three (laughs) times a day. I wore my knees out. I had to put pads on my knees. (laughs) So it was great. And I just loved her for it, as I say, without being repetitive again. Just to have a faith is such an essential ingredient in your life. I don't know how you live without faith. And this is what's happening. We can see deteriorations across the fields, deteriorating, because people don't have the faith. And so we've got to do everything in our our power to try and convert people to believe, but give them good reasons to do it. That's the big thing. If you're a salesman as such and you have a product, and we have the best product in the world, you've got to know what you're saying and you've got to appeal to people because there are a lot of devils out there that are against us. Amanda, what would you add to that? Well, you know, I I think we all have different places on our spiritual journeys, and I think it's really essential that we extend love and mercy and grace to to each other as we navigate that journey. And so I think it is challenging. I know my mom desperately, she loved, she loved, adored my dad. And I know she, her greatest dream was to go on a mission with him. She just thought he would be the greatest missionary. <laughs> and she's right. And she's she, right. Exactly. She's gotten a little taste of she's that. Right. Right. A little taste. He's the greatest, <laughs> greatest missionary, right? But, I, you know, I think what is essential is that we focus on the positive. I think focus on what brings us together. And um, I know that that's, you know, my dad's 
actually was just sharing with him the other night, just we were out for dinner and and we were talking about religion and he stood as a witness of Jesus Christ um, before I did. And I was just so grateful for his example. And so I think maintaining a focus on the Savior and how we can build our faith in him is one of the greatest things that we can do. And I think everything else ultimately will fall in place after that. Amanda, let me ask you one one more question before we get to our last question. How would you say that I think I'm listening to both of you and I'm like, wow, incredible faith, incredible faith in Jesus Christ. And when you grow grown up in a home where that faith was already there, I think it's really easy to be like, well, why would you need to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? So how would you say that the church has blessed your life? Oh my goodness. You know, I'm just so grateful. I I can't imagine my life without being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think the greatest blessing that the gospel has been to me, or the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, is being able to, it's been a vehicle for me to come to know Christ. So serving, and I always say every calling is an opportunity, is a vehicle to come to know Christ. So serving in my in different callings, especially as a missionary, was a life-changing, a life-changing experience for me. It taught me to rely on the Lord and to to draw upon his power. He taught me to love his work and to love all people. And uh, I think through through the gospel, it's helped me to know that he knows me and helped me to know him in a profound way. So, you know, it's it's been such a blessing in my life. And I'm so grateful for it to have been, to have been made covenants and that bind me to him and to to others. And it's given me incredible purpose and direction. And so... I'll be eternally grateful for for that opportunity. Gary, one last question for you before we get to our last, last question. You previously told my coworker, Haley, I've always been a great admirer of the church. Um, What would you say it is that you have admired most about the church and, and how have you seen it bless both Amanda and Vivian's life and or the life of your family in general? Well, coming back to the most important uh, word in your life is love, because that is God to the hilt. And this church, if you look at it, what it's done, look at your, look at your, your what do you call them, the, the places where they keep all the clothing, what's it called? The, yes, where they manage, you know, get the clothes and they send it out to people. Now, on my ranch, I wanted to give our staff, you know, because incentivization is a big thing. And uh, we wanted to give them a nice surprise. And I casually mentioned it to, I think it was to President Hinckley when we met. And the next thing, here arrives this big crater of beautiful clothing. And this is what the church does. They do great good without blowing their own trumpet and telling people what they do. They do so much good around the world. And they're not always given the recognition that they deserve, unfortunately. But in the end, People will realize it, and they teach their children to have good manners, and manners maketh a man. You know, I've got 22 American grandchildren, and I phone them up. I say, how are you, Joe? He says, good. Now, listen to this. You do a test. You'll see 90% of American children say, you say, how are you? Good. And I'd say, Joe, how are you doing? Good. I said, you little pig, how are you doing? Oh, fine. Thank you, Grandpa. How are you? So, you know, to be able to greet people, and, and this is what this church does. It teaches them to have manners. It teaches them to dress well. It teaches them to have the most important word in their lives, respect. Respect, and that is so important. I cannot go over the things that this church teach you. Yesterday, I went along to the church with Amanda, and then we had a, rece- a session there with elderly people, and we had the most wonderful conversation. And we had this lady stand up and sing in the church, and we had the children sing. It was just the most wonderful. It was like having an injection of energy. I left that church feeling revived. I mean, it just gives you such strength. So, Morgan, uh, let me just... Uh, In conclusion, just to say how much I've enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I know Amanda has, and, and God bless your church, and God bless America. 
Thank you so much. My last question for you is the question that we ask at the end of every episode of this podcast. And that is, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, for me, it's very simple. It's, you know, we all need guidance in our lives. Doesn't matter how old you are. I'm 86 and I'm really only 50. I mean, I'm fit. I still do thousands of sit-ups. I still play golf well. I still not even think of retiring, traveling around the world. But I wake up every day and I get a message. That's the message I get. And it's a clear message. And it helps you, what you have on your ring, which is self-explanatory. C-T-R. Choose the right. You have the choice. In this country, you have the choice to choose the right or choose the wrong. It's surprising how many people choose the wrong. It's going to help me to choose the right in spite of all my faults. And I pray for forgiveness of my faults every day because we're all inundated with faults. And we must never be judgmental on people. And we must learn to forgive and have love in our hearts. And that's the message I get from the church. Thank you so much, Amanda. Oh my goodness, I love this question. I thought about it so much, Morgan. But I love what Elder Holland said in the last conference. He said he played with people. He said, please, please come enjoy the full feast, even if you don't like the broccoli. And I love that. <laughs> and I also think about a quote my mom would always say to me, and she'd say, look up and reach out. And I think we've got to keep trying and keep keep striving to stay focused on the Savior. And and really continually turning to him, regardless of what happens in our life or the circumstances that we find ourselves in, to really work on developing that personal relationship with him on a daily basis. And I believe once we, we do that, the natural result is reaching out. And like my dad always taught us, the greatest word ever is the word love. And so choosing love every day and choosing to to respond with love to in all our relationships and all our interactions, I would say to me means to be all in in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you both so much. I have to tell listeners because they won't be able to see you. And so it's been so sweet to talk with both of you and to see Amanda, you reach over and rub your dad's arm. And I think it's clear that there's such a sweet relationship that you both share and one that your mom has to be so proud of. And just thank you both so much for taking the time to be with me and and for sharing your faith in Jesus Christ. We are so grateful to Amanda Lee Player Hall and Gary Player for joining us on this week's episode. You can learn more about the Gary and Vivian Player Foundation by visiting Gary and Vivian Player Foundation.org. You can also visit our show notes for a link to this and any other relevant links to any episode of this podcast. Big thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix at Six Studios for his help with this episode. And thank you so much for listening.